Hi, this is Greg Gornert of Gornert Wealth Management, and this is my Insights and Perspectives podcast. In this episode, I'll look at how 2019 is shaping up in the markets and how it's affecting your wealth. And we'll be joined for our feature, If I Knew Then Business Interview, by the founder of Vancouver's very own Dirty Apron Cooking School and Delicatessen, Chef David Robertson. If you go back and, and talk to David Robertson 10 years ago, starting this out, what piece of advice or insight could you offer him? A little while ago, I was able to catch up with David Robertson at his very busy cooking school for a fascinating interview. My guest today has won gold as part of a team at the 1996 World Culinary Olympics in Switzerland. Uh, He's traveled the world cooking for celebrities like John Travolta, Diana Ross, Warren Buffett, and Neil Armstrong, which is my personal favorite. Uh, And he's also the founder of the fabulous Dirty Apron Cooking School and Delicatessen, Chef David Robertson. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Good to be here. uh, Can you take me back to where this all started with the Dirty Apron? Yeah, so the the Dirty Apron was... uh, a dream before it became a reality and um, certainly my career and my career path started off with uh, love for food and mother was a at-home cook I was the son of a butcher so I was predestined I guess to make a hit at the culinary industry Um, had an opportunity to cook all around the world Um, I think eight to nine different countries work with different chefs I've worked everything from Michelin restaurants in New York to little family pubs in Bermuda and I just love the fact of how food brought people together and in 2004 when I moved back from Switzerland to Vancouver I took a job at a local restaurant here and I just could see in people there were so many questions and, and w- things they wanted to know of how to create great restaurant style food at home. And I realized there was no real recreational culinary school happening in our city. There was no type way where people were demystifying how things were done in the culinary industry. And so we, we kind of took that on and we wanted to create a business, a place of excellence where people came in, they were cooking off the best of the best, working with the best quality ingredients, and just really kind of uncovering the veil of any confusion of how do you do things in the restaurant and do that at home, whether pan searing halibut or roasting a meat perfectly. And we started that off in 2009. We've been here 10 years. We've taught over 100,000 people how to cook, and it just keeps growing. Yeah, 100,000 people. That's amazing. When you get started, were there any other restaurant cooking schools out there in the city, or is it something brand new? We were actually the first in North America to open our business and doors as a recreational style kitchen to teach people how to learn how to cook at home first. Well, did anyone just say, this is crazy, or is it a really scary moment when you tried to, uh, I guess, did you take over a restaurant here and, and turn it into a school, or how did that all come together? Yeah, so we... <clears throat> We, um, well, you'll remember 2008 quite well being in the finance sector. Um, not my favorite time. And um, we, we, we didn't know what we were up against, but it actually kind of worked out in our favor to, to open a place. People realized, hey, we got to stop eating out less and start learning how to cook more at home. People saving a few more dollars. Um, we, had we done it a year when things were booming, we would have had a harder time trying to get access to all the trades and people in here. So our first year, we saw some of the pros and cons from that sort of financial crash in the market to opening a business. Some mm-hmm. things favored us, some things didn't. Um, one thing that didn't was a 14% interest loan from the bank our first year, which uh, thank goodness has been paid off but we we looked around we did our due diligence we looked for right places um business will always be a risk and we knew we were making our taking a risk but we were taking an educated risk we were doing our homework we were trying to get an understanding we put out surveys to see what people would like to learn in the area would this be uh, received well in this neighborhood 
And with all that, we kind of set out to start the Dirty Apron. And we started as a cooking school our first year. And then and it, it got booming right away. And after one year, we turned our shop into a deli. I think we went from about six staff to 25 staff within a year. Today, we have about 45 staff. And with the success of our deli, we then be launched into becoming a catering company. So, but it all originally started with just the desire to want to, and passion to teach people. And everything naturally and organically grew from that. So tell me about some of the people that you surrounded yourself to, to begin with. Because you, you taught, you're very specific, you say we, you don't say you when you started this. So how did it, who's the first people that you brought on board to, to share that vision with you? Yeah, well, one, one uh, firstly, my wife, who we work closely with, she works with the marketing and branding. Sarah, um, sort of, uh, the, when you walk into the Dirty Apron and the feel and the look and also just everything from website. So she, she kind of handled that part. Because it, it looks lovely. And, and the, the table that you've got here, uh, I know I've had my events here, and it is, it's spectacular. Yeah, so thank you. Kudos to her. And we wanted that. We wanted people to feel like they were coming into our home and sitting down, that it wasn't kind of wanted the business feel to almost sort of uh, go away as people would sit in here and have a glass of wine and, and sit down and have their meal. And then with the, the I worked with the, the kitchen crew and the team, building them up, um, always looking to hire talented people. Um, you know, to be a chef at a restaurant is different than asking a chef to come teach people and entertain them and have a little bit of patient so so two different worlds um i definitely didn't recruit anybody's from the the michelin restaurants i was working at i think the patience was a little different and and also when i say we i, I have staff that have been here with me since day one oh, so incredible. so we we've been very um lucky to have kept staff you know for for up to 10 years with some um, you know, and so I say we because I, I think they've taken ownership of it. It feels like their business and it's like their home. And that, that has served us so well is making the staff feel like this is part of what they do, too. Interesting, interesting. So when you went to the bank and you had a 14 percent loan, middle of financial crisis, mm -hmm. what was the reaction? I've always been a risk taker. I, I thought to myself, man, if this doesn't work, we'll just sell everything and move to Mexico <laughs> and live on a beach with our dog. I don't know. I, 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 I kind of, sometimes you're so excited about something, uh -huh. you don't hear the numbers. And maybe that was a good thing at that time. And looking back, I thought, oh my goodness, would I do that same move today? And I don't know if I would. But... But then you, we, we saw areas where things were working really well. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the one thing is, is I, I really felt that I went into business with the idea of I'm going to be successful. We're going to make this happen. I will do everything. And it was more of a mindset that I created for myself. I wouldn't let the option of failure even find its way into my mind. And... I don't know if you want to call that the power of positive thinking, but I just realized I, I knew what I needed to do. I had a clear idea. I had a clear vision. And if I failed doing it, then I failed. But that was my approach to it. Um, it, it was only one bank talking to us at the time because there was not a whole lot of banks lining up to give out loans. Um, I was able to put a, some of my own skin in the game, which helped. Um, we were able at that time to negotiate a fairly good rent to move in here. And so there were certain things that were moving in our favor. We, we wanted to have the best of the best uh, cooking equipment. One of my stoves cost $12,000. And when I first opened my door, I need, realized I need 15 of them. And so I, we got this idea. Let's just approach the company and say, you know, people get to test drive top of the line cars out there. Who gets to test drive great stoves and great ovens? I'm in a meeting thinking they're probably thinking I'm crazy for pitching this, but I get a call three days later and I have Wolf and Sub Zero, which is the creme de la creme of uh, cooking equipment, saying, we'd love to see our stoves and our fridges in there. 
I mean, that, that almost at that time amounted to over $200,000. And then we were like, wow, who else could we do well, this? Yeah. <laughs> who else out there wants to well, have us endorse? Yeah, and but it's always that edge of brilliance and craziness that you're not quite sure which side you're on. <laughs> That's true. And so, I, you know, I didn't go to business school. I went to culinary school. So I think sometimes you can be... Um, you can learn what you learn, and it's almost in a cookie-cutter style way. And I think because I didn't have that style way, I just thought, you know what, everything can happen from a good conversation, and people will either say yes or no. And so shortly after, I got on the phone with uh, all clad pots and pans. I, I was like, man, I love those pans. One set costs like $1,500. Let's see if, if they'd like to put 22 of those sets on those same stoves and ovens. And they were on board. And then we started getting cheeky. We were like, okay, who are we calling next? Who, who, who else is out there? <laughs> and was amazed at how many people and other companies jumped on board with our idea and, and wanted to be a part of it. And so I would always tell people, whatever your business is, who, who's there to support that and who will come alongside you and want to be a part of that? Wow. So you get it all set up and you said that it took off right away. It didn't, it, there was no, like, uh, what, what kind of marketing did you do to get to people in, in the restaurant? You just put a sign out front and went... We're here? We, um, at that time, I was, uh, I'd left my chef job at Shambar Restaurant. Okay. And so with the owners there, we, we set out something to do. Um, we, and we started Dirty Apron together. And since then, I've, 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 they've moved on and I've bought out sh their, all their shares. But we, we put out a survey to a database of 30,000 people. And that was a sort of an attentive database, which was very crucial in helping to get set up and get word out there. And in the first little bit, you know, there was opportunity to do a little bit of local TV and media, and I would go on do cooking segments, and, and I've been doing that ever since for, for about 10 years now. And, and, and just slowly getting the word out of there. Because we are an experience, because we're a place that you come, and we're not like a typical night out at a restaurant. You're experiencing something. You're learning something. You're being empowered. We found that was enough in itself to be such a good tool for people to use as word of mouth. It's like, hey, what did you do this week? Oh, man, I, I did this whole new experience. I learned how to go in and make lobster thermidor or pansy or a halib halibut, debone a Cornish game hand, make a burblon. And, and when you empower people to do new things and try new things, they naturally talk about it. So we found that was our best tool for marketing. Now, interesting. Now, you're taking people who've never cooked before. I've been in the environment. It's a fantastic environment. Your, your staff is so helpful. Um, but sometimes there must be things where people get themselves into trouble or drinking some wine or something or have never done something. And like, what's the... Is there an incident you could say that, that surprised you in, in one of your sessions? Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we, we, we've seen a lot. When you, when you see 10,000 people a year cook, it's like sitting at a traffic light and watching 10,000 people drive. You're, you're just going to see different results. You're going to see a little road rage. You're going to see some different temperaments. <laughs> Cooking's not much different within itself. You're, there, there is a, a pressure element. You, you need to do put in the work. You need to do it. Some people get into a zone and they do incredibly well. Our, our job is to see the deer in the headlights. We've had situations where I had somebody get off a long flight coming in from Hong Kong and they came right from the airport to the dirty apron to do a class and they fainted after an hour. So you deal with it. Um, we've seen people every now and then, you'll see a small nick, you'll see a burn. Um, that's every day, that's normal day life in the kitchen. So you make sure you're equipped and people know how to handle that. Um, but for the most part, we've been pretty good over the years. Everybody has made it into the dining room with a meal in hand. And we always say, if you did a good job, pat yourself on the back, it was all you. And if you didn't, just sign up for another cooking class. Well, what I was amazed when I... When I brought my group in, if I, I focus on bringing couples in just to see the interaction between the couples because there's no hiding in the kitchen. No. And you get to see the real interaction, the real personalities and the real where the power lies and where it doesn't. And uh, yeah. I, I always enjoy seeing people um, being themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and you put them that, especially when there's, 
Um, you know, sometimes there's a you can have competitions between different groups, which is I think that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I. Uh, no, it, it's that was truly experience. Now, now going back, if you knew what you know now, ten years later, it's a huge success. Uh, you've branched off into a delicatessen. You've branched off into uh, a, a catering service. Uh, ten years ago, starting this out, what piece of advice or insight could you offer him? Uh, looking back now, yeah, make it bigger. Make it bigger. Make it bigger. So we have found over the years we run at 100% occupancy. We're full every night. So you, you think we do, you know, and, and I know uh, to come for a class, people might say, well, that's an expensive night out. But, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're equipping people and training people. But we started with, we have 22 hands-on stations. It's $180 if somebody were to come. Then we also have uh, 200 different companies that come in here a year. We see everyone from our professional sports teams to finance sector to all the banks, 25 different law firms, you name it. We see them come through. So if I could go back and tell myself what could I do because we see wait lists every night, accommodate those wait lists. So what we sort of did is about two, three years ago is I created not a hands-on style, but a demo and dine style on my other part of the restaurant. So how does that work? So we sell it at a bit of a cheaper price point and people don't cook, but they come and we accommodate a room of 20 people. They sit and watch the chef do a demo. There's another chef preparing it and we plate all the food in front of them, but they still get the education, they still get the entertainment and they still get the great night out. They're just not doing it. And that has brought in a whole new other clientele. So going back, I, I believe I would tell myself to think a little bit bigger Um, but in a smart way, and be very thoughtful of the people that you put into management to run your business for you. Uh, We've all, for those that have opened their own business, you've either made some really great hires or some really bad hires. So we're very methodical of who comes onto the team now, and that's something we've learned over time. Interesting. Well, I just want to thank you for taking the time, and uh, I'm totally looking forward to our event again here. Uh, It's always a great time. Thank you once again, Chef David Robertson. Great. Thanks, Rick. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and visit us at my website, greggorner.com. That's G-R-E-G-G-O-E-R-N-E-R-T.com.